Welcome back to Best Practice, my masterclass series where we learn the art, science, and sport of practicing. This week we look at a little known but excellent and elegant system for fundamental technique by Dimitrios Konstantin Dunes. Now before we begin, I'd like to announce that I'm going to be selling my violin bow. Um, this is a gold-mounted bow made by the renowned German maker Klaus Grunke, who's still living. And Grunke is one of the most respected uh, makers and experts in the world. And uh, this is a Dominique Picot model. Uh, it weighs 61.5 grams, so a, a nice comfortable weight. Um, this has been my bow for from the past eight years. So Pretty much everything you've heard or seen of me um, is featuring this bow and um, I learned a lot by using it over the years and it's just a very comfortable and uh, a rich sounding bow with great articulation. Um, so uh, I wanted to offer it to all of my, my, my YouTube community and I'd be really happy if anyone uh, is interested in uh, knowing more about the bow. So feel free to send me an email. Um, if you want to see more pictures or certificates or whatever. Now on to the video. Dunas was a Greek violin pedagogue in the mid 20th century and he was mainly known for his approach to the proper ergonomics of violin playing as well as the development of muscular strength and flexibility in the parts of the hand. Um, maybe more than anything he developed an approach that was as much mental as it is physical. Dunis studied with Ondricek, who uh, actually premiered the Dvorak Violin Concerto and was also a, a fantastic composer of violin exercises. Dunis later enrolled as a medical student in the University of Vienna. And then he spent many years helping musicians um, that were suffering from pains and uh, other conditions that impaired their playing. He would actually spend months observing a musician, watching them play, watching them practice, listening, analyzing, and trying to understand their problem in the context of their own physique. It is from that standpoint that he developed um, his famous exercises. Now, many violinists are familiar with the Big Blue Book of Dunis exercises. Um, this collection contains arguably his most famous works, and a lot of the stuff in here really pushes violin technique to the limits. So it's not really designed for uh, beginner or intermediate players, and even advanced violinists have trouble with this. Now, many don't know that Dunas actually also designed some exercises that were aimed at all levels and focus on the fundamentals of technique. His Opus 23, titled Fundamental Technical Studies, is one such exercise, and it's designed to, uh, in his words, obtain the maximum of results with a minimum of time and toil. Dunas crafts the exercises by alternating between slow and fast notes in a manner designed to test and train different combinations of fingers based on the suboptimal anatomy of the hand. If you've ever wondered why the fingers aren't all equally agile, we know that the proximity of interconnection between the branches of the radial and ulnar nerves hampers the complete independent movement of the ring and pinky fingers. What you should know about Dunas is that his approach was very scientific and very rational. Um, he believed that one must train the brain and the memory as much as the fingers and the hands and the arms. And his exercises were essentially designed to teach you to think about your movements before you make them. Um, the way that we can coordinate this process is in three steps. So there's the mental process, there is the nervous system, which sends those mental signals to uh, the 
parts of your body in question, and the actual muscular action. Um, this is all integrated into one controlled reflex. And it's key that this does become a reflex, that it becomes automatic. Because when we play fast, even the most talented among us, the most quick-witted, uh, aren't able to actually think of every single finger action um, in a fast passage. So according to Dunis, the secret is to train very slowly um, individual fingers and then begin to group notes intelligently and create reflexive actions out of those groups. Now this is done through very careful and methodical practice and Opus 23 lays this process out very beautifully and um, in a very simple manner that's accessible. Let's start with a quick overview of the book. So there are three sections and the first section um, is six sequences that focus on balancing clarity um, and that covers all the important interval patterns between the fingers. Um, and I modify this slightly to kind of uh, systematize that variation in the interval patterns. Section two is seven sequences that focus on lateral movement. So fi uh, individual fingers moving uh, side to side and just the overall independence of fingers. Section three is four sequences that focus on string crossings and um, how to achieve economy in the bow arm. So let's look at the exercise in more detail. Um, so in section one, each sequence is uh, defined by a rhythm pattern that is played on the G, then D, A, E, and then it's reversed, and then you go E, A, D, G, back down. Um, so the first pattern sounds like this. So you're basically doing an A minor uh, scale here and you just go up using the same rhythm pattern. And then on the way down it's reversed. Then number two, the same idea but the rhythm pattern changes. And on the way down. And then we have number three, um, sounds like this. Etc. The number four. Etc. Then you have number five, which sounds like this. And then way down. Then number six, finally. Then on the way down. And that is the end of section one. Here are a few very important things to keep in mind when practicing this. 
Um, so the first thing is about finger articulation. Um, as I've talked about in some of my other videos, it's very important to move the fingers from the base joint, right? They should be moving like this, like little hammers. We don't want to be moving them like this because this is a tense sort of motion and we're wasting a lot of energy and it's slow. So we want to kind of throw the fingers like that. Um, so that becomes very important when you're trying to be accurate with this exercise. So each finger is thrown and it's making a little bit of an articulation. But we're not pressing, right? Like a, the hammer of the piano, um, it hits, but then it immediately releases. So that's our goal, to do a very articulate um, up and down motion with the finger, but never to sustain any kind of force once we um, make impact. Um, now, the next thing is um, thumb relaxation. You definitely want to keep an eye on not only the thumb, but also the wrist and the finger tension. And every bar or two, I like to kind of check in and maybe even do a little kind of wiggle to make sure. Um, vibrating the long notes. Uh, after you get comfortable with this exercise, you should try to uh, vibrate all, both of the long notes in each pattern. So. So there's always two or three notes that you can definitely vibrate. Um, and that ensures that your hand stays flexible and um, nothing is uh, very tense because otherwise vibrato won't be possible. Um, and obviously make sure in that case that your vibrato is not kind of a shaking the instrument sort of motion that you're not clenching, but it really is a, a truly free, free sort of motion. Now this is actually a very, very good vibrato exercise because vibrating a note immediately um, after coming out of some fast notes is very difficult to do. And that's uh, something you'll notice in, in very good violinists. Um, it, it's kind of this connective tissue that uh, helps a phrase keep its intensity. Now if we don't practice this, it just never happens. And then your vibrato is always a little bit delayed. Um, so this is, a, this is a very good exercise for that. Now the next thing to keep in mind is that the rhythm has to be very, very accurate, um, especially with the fast notes. It's not enough to just kind of throw the fingers. Kind of not, not really noticing how they're coming down one after the other. Um, they actually have to each have their rhythmic articulation. So I'm feeling each one of those ta 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 ba 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 bum. And as I speed that up, I'm gonna make sure I maintain that feeling. So even in a fast tempo. Ta -ta -tum, I feel each one of those articulating. We're focusing on our left hand here a lot. We wanna make sure we don't neglect the right hand. So in the right hand, it's important to just keep a very, very constant and um, almost disconnected stroke. Um, part of finger independence is also building hand independence. So no matter what kind of action is going on in the left hand, the right hand should just be really, really steady. Now, if you want to get more advanced with this, there are a couple little changes you can make. If you change the 16th notes to 30 seconds, that will provide some new difficulties. So whereas before it was... you can make it into this. So that, that's challenging for um, coordination as well. One thing to remember when practicing this is that less is more. So the faster you wanna go, the more difficult you wanna make this, um, the less effort you should use, right? It's not that more difficult means we have to uh, engage more muscles and kind of work harder. It's not like we're adding weights and, and, and lifting heavier weights. It should be the opposite. How can I work less? How can I use less energy? Um, for example, with trills, the faster you go with a trill, the 
less motion you have to um, use in the finger. Likewise with this, if I'm practicing this very slowly, I want to exaggerate that lifting and falling of the fingers. Um, But then as soon as I speed that up, um, I want everything to be smaller. It's a good idea to also repeat each bar at least several times, maybe even four times. And each time you repeat it, um, use less energy, use less effort, disengage parts of your body that are not necessary, and try to focus your thoughts only on um, the muscles that need to move, the finger that, that is playing. It's also a good idea to um, mark the patterns that are specifically challenging, because um, some of these are gonna be easy. So on the A string, this pattern might be easy, but on the D string, the same pattern might be challenging, or a different pattern is just challenging on all strings. So definitely mark those, practice those every single day. Now, this exercise becomes really interesting when you start integrating um, all the different interval patterns, because it's written out in A minor, but that's just one example. So I'm gonna go through six groups of interval patterns, and basically I took what Dunas wrote and I kind of expanded it and um, organized it a bit, and you'll see what I mean when you look at the page. So first we have um, two half steps and one whole step. So half step, half step, half step. Right, it's kind of a weird combination. But these different interval combinations will bring out different aspects of the finger motion, right? So one might be strong and the other might feel weaker. So... Now there are three different ways you can do uh, two half steps and one whole step, right? You can have half, half, whole, or you can have half, whole, half, or whole, half, half. Um, so here's another one. So you have whole, half, half. Right, so I'd practice it the same way with all six of those um, rhythm variations in, in the section one. Um, you know, on the G, the D, the E, and the, on the way down, you can reverse it. So it's the same thing, but you're substituting different interval patterns. Um, so the second group of interval patterns is three whole steps, which is also known as the whole tone scale. The third group is half step, half step, and then whole plus half step, so a minor third. So we could do... Or if I have the, whole, the half steps in the beginning. And there are three ways to mix and match half, half, whole plus half as well. Now, the fourth uh, group of patterns is half step, whole step, whole plus half step. And there are six variations because you can mix and match um, those three different intervals um, six times. So for example, we can do, that's whole, half, whole plus half. Another variant would be whole, whole plus half, and then half. So, the fifth set of intervals is two whole steps and a whole plus half step. So, one of the variations would be. The final set of intervals is all minor thirds, um, otherwise known as a diminished arpeggio. And it's definitely the most challenging one. It requires um, a considerable 
stretch between each finger. So. One thing to remember is that for each of these sets of intervals, the first and fourth finger will always be playing the same notes, no matter what order those intervals are in. So as you switch things up, you switch strings, you switch the order of the intervals, um, remember that one and four have to stay constant. So practice these interval variations after you get really comfortable and your fingers get really strong playing the exercise as written. And you can even come up with combinations. So on the G, you do one interval pattern, on the D, you do another. Um, so if you're marking down which particular um, combinations are the most challenging for you, you can just keep practicing those every single day and mix and match them. Part two is all about the lateral movement of the fingers. Um, this is a vital exercise for the independence and the strength of fingers, but also for uh, any sort of chromatic passages or scales. And similarly to section one, we have patterns starting on the lowest string, going to the highest, and then on the way down, changing a little bit. So here's number one. And then we play that on the D, A, and E. Each time he targets um, a specific finger for this lateral motion. For, so for number one, that was the third finger going from C sharp to C natural. And then on number two, it's the second finger. Number three would be the first finger. Number four focuses on the second finger again, but now it's the relationship between two and four. Number five deals with the first finger again, but now it's the relationship between one and three. Number six deals with one again, um, but now it's the relationship between one and four. Finally, number seven combines everything into a sort of chromatic scale. As with the first section, it's imperative that you practice this very slowly. Um, so if you have to split the bowings in half, or in three, or in four, definitely do that. And as you speed things up, remember what Dunas said. Um, this idea of grouping notes together after you've practiced things slowly, and starting to turn um, those groups into reflexes. So, for example, when I do this slowly, I would play it like this. Right, I would make sure every single note has this very, very clear articulation. But when I speed it up, I'm looking for kind of milestones where I can set groups. So I'm noticing, I'm noticing where that shift happens. And every time I have that shift, I feel like that's one group, right? So you can come up with your own groupings. Um, it's kind of up to your sense of pattern recognition. Um, but it's just important that you always are on the lookout for those groups. In section three, Dunas lays out sequences that act as sort of tongue twisters for your bow arm. Unlike many other bow exercises, he is constantly changing the pattern just enough that it requires your full attention and requires your awareness. So if you start playing these more fluently, you start to also improve your uh, focus and your attention span. So number one looks like this. The next bar. And then number two goes like this. Number 
number four no longer travels from low to high back to low. Um, it's rather just a series of tongue twisters that uh, span all the strings. Some of these bars are very tricky, so it's a good idea to split them up, either one beat at a time or combining first and second beat, second and third, third and fourth, etc. So this one. We practice each of those beats with the first note of the next beat. So, and then I can combine beats one and two. So then that's the coordination of the left hand um, that becomes the important thing here. When you lift three. Finally, at the very end, um, Dunas lists four different bowing patterns that you could use for the entire third section. There are some important things to keep in mind when practicing section three. Um, remember that these are small string crossings, right? We're never um, skipping a string in this exercise. So that means that the role of the wrist and the forearm uh, really is highlighted. So if we're doing something like... That sort of string crossing makes no sense to do with the arm. So much extra motion. So all of these string crossings should be done with minimal amounts of motion. So try to keep it to the wrist and uh, make sure that the string crossing is not affecting the overall stroke of the bow. Right? We don't want this sort of thing to affect the actual horizontal motion of the string. Also remember that no matter um, where you are in the bow, if you're doing a small string crossing, like between two notes, it doesn't get larger in its motion as you move to the tip. And I see this mistake a lot. I see people doing this. Whether they know it or not, their motion is amplified by quite a lot. So remember to go against your instinct and keep the motion small. It's almost like a double stop, right? Oof. Gut strings need to be tuned very frequently. So when you start putting these small string crossings together, and you have that, and you do start going through all of the strings, you have to be kind of like a snake and um, you have to anticipate what that path is going to be, right? Because we want, we want this motion to be smooth. And if you're not anticipating, you're going to have these sudden jerky motions for your string crossings, um, and that's not going to work. So one way to practice a particularly difficult spot, if you're not sure how the trajectory of the arm should go, um, stop on the double stop before the final note. So instead of... If you're having trouble with that string crossing, I would do find that double stop. The double stop will always show you how small the necessary motion for string crossings should be. Finally, make sure you're not letting go of the sound when your bow is changing strings. Um, so you don't want gaps between them. So it's like you're buttering a piece of bread. Right, you want to keep that consistent weight into the index finger, no matter what strings you're on. I remember when the genius of this exercise first hit me. I was practicing the D minor partita of Bach, and the first movement, the allemand, has this tricky part in it that was always annoying for me. I couldn't quite figure out why it 
didn't sound good. I would record myself thinking I played it okay and listening back, I'd be saying, uh, that's not how a good violinist should sound. Um, it's this passage. And after practicing enough dunas, and really doing it the right way, I had this revelation, and that was that all of these passages that I thought I was playing really, really clearly and articulately, I was kind of just throwing fingers, and you know, it was kind of in tune and kind of okay, but never great. And so that was uh, very important. Also in this passage, um, I like to play it in first position, so there are some awkward string crossings. Um, And obviously they have to sound really smooth. And section three of Dunas really helped me understand the importance of um, the wrist in these small string crossing motions, um, but also the idea of kind of planning out that trajectory in a situation where it's not like there are two notes on one string, two notes on the next string, and everything's nice and even. Um, the sort of mixed up patterns that Dunas writes help in real world situations like this one where you might have one note on one string and then three notes on the other string. It has to sound like one thing. So um, yeah, this exercise really pays uh, dividends. So to wrap up, one of the things that Dunas can really teach us with this exercise is how to avoid um, repeating passages and scales blindly and uh, unintelligently. Um, this hope that, you know, if you just repeat it this many times that there will be some sort of general improvement um, is a false hope. So I hope you like this elegant little system as much as I do and please uh, leave some comments down below, um, questions, maybe some variations if, if you can think of uh, new ways of playing this exercise I'd love to see that. And just to remind you I am making other violin videos on my Patreon page so if you head over there you can check it out um, consider becoming a subscriber at any level and you will unlock all of that content. So happy practicing and see you next time.